Poppy Playtime Chapter 3 has been sweeping in reviews and sales and is one of the best showings that Mob Entertainment and honestly mascot horror in general has given for a long time. I've made my thoughts known on the earlier chapters of this franchise and they weren't incredibly positive. But then Peak dropped and we have to talk about it. I've already covered the lore and theories of this chapter, so what about the game itself? Well, that's what we're here today to discuss. So Slices, put on your aprons and let's bake ourselves a theory. Before we begin, Again, I should clarify that as objective as I'm trying to be here, at the end of the day, horror is fundamentally subjective especially in how it's experienced. At this point, I'm rarely scared when I play games. I think the last time a game genuinely scared me except for Shipwreck 64 was something like Happy Humble Burger Farm, and that came out more than two years ago. All this to say, I'm pretty damn numb to horror games at this point, but I can still appreciate the artistry that goes into crafting a good horror experience. Just because something doesn't scare me personally doesn't mean it's not scary. And furthermore, everything in this video is just my opinion. I don't have a degree on game design or anything in the field, I've got a creative writing degree, that's about it. So if you disagree with any of the points I make in this video, that's entirely valid. Although I do ask that if you do vehemently disagree with me, why not elaborate yourself in the comments? I'd love to see it. Not to just engagement bait you, but I, I am curious. Now let's actually get into it. The entire franchise of Poppy Playtime has something major that it has to contend with, and it's having monsters that look scary and imposing, yet simultaneously cute and nice enough to be believably a toy that children would want. It's some Something that a lot of FNAF fan games mess up, I've noticed. Where they spend so much time focusing on making a really scary animatronic, they forget to make sure that it would actually be appealing to kids at all. It's a delicate line to balance, and it's a line that makes mascot horror shine when it's done well. If you go too far into the horror, then people don't believe that any kid would ever actually like this thing. But if you don't go far enough in the horror, you risk not being scary. Poppy Playtime has a mixed history with this, admittedly, but we can use chapters 1 and 2 as an example of what to do and what not to do when compared to chapter 3, because chapter 1 treads that line incredibly well. Huggy Wuggy, for as memed as he's become, is genuinely a good design for a kid's toy. It leans on those old monkey toys with the Velcro hands, and it makes sense that the merchandise of this character sells incredibly well. It's just a good toy design. So how do they translate that into horror? Well, they make him huge and give him teeth. That alone already works. A tall, lanky creature is inherently unsettling, but it's not so far removed from the original design. However, Huggy Wuggy's strength comes in his utilization, specifically that you see his full toy form immediately. But once you turn away and turn back, he's gone. Once he's established as a threat, you no longer see him. And then throughout the rest of the chapter, you just get hints that he's there in the background. You only get his full monster form reveal when he is an active threat. And at that point, you can't stand there to appreciate the design, you have to run. And taking this massive creature and forcing Forcing him to follow you through such a small, confined space only adds to the claustrophobia and horror of this creature. Chapter 1 does a great job in dealing with utilization of a monster like Huggy Wuggy, if admittedly the chapter 1 as a whole is relatively lacking in content. It's like a half hour long. So how does chapter 2 compare? Well admittedly, it's kind of an example of what not to do, in my opinion. I spoke at length about what I think about chapter 2's horror in a full video, but granted that video is like over a year old and it didn't age terribly well. Not to say the content of it is bad, I still agree with the points I made, but you could just tell that I've gotten a lot better in the past year making videos. Um, I'm nowhere near the level I want to be, but looking back at that, I do cringe. So to spare you from having to watch an old video, let me summarize briefly my point. The monster designs in Chapter 2 are much more believably toys than they are monsters. They go a little bit too far in the other direction. Mommy and the whole crew, PJ Pugapillar, Bunzo, the mini was even, they all are incredibly believable toys, but because of that, they all sort of lack that scare factor that Huggy Wuggy has. Now, this isn't terrible on the surface. These creature designs are fine and can work well if utilized properly. I just also don't think that in Chapter 2 they were utilized properly. We got full body shots of all of these creatures immediately. We knew everything about how they looked right away, and because of that, it was harder to be afraid of them. Personally, I believe that if if your creature design on the surface of it isn't inherently scary, which admittedly a lot of mascot horror has to sacrifice the fear factor to make it a believable mascot, they become a lot 
more effective when they aren't fully known. A perfect example of this is FNAF 1. Not to constantly compare Poppy Playtime and FNAF, they're very separate and different games, and I honestly get annoyed when every single mascot horror gets compared to FNAF, but I realize that the vast majority of my community is FNAF fans, so if I use a FNAF game, you'll immediately know what I'm talking about. Anyway, the FNAF 1 animatronics aren't scary. Like, on the face of it, they are not scary. Freddy, Bonnie, Chica, Foxy, and Golden Freddy are not scary designs at all. But they are very scary in FNAF 1 because of the unknown. We never really get a full, clear shot of them. Even when they're on stage, the camera's too close and it's at such an angle that you're not quite sure what they look like. And then throughout most of the renders on the cameras, they're either slightly unseen, far away, too close, somewhat obscured in the dark, or they're posed in a strange way. You never get a great look at them. The FNAF 1 animatronics work so well because they aren't fully known until it's too late. The only time you get a fully, clearly lit shot of the body of an animatronic is when they're actively killing you, so at that point, it, you can barely tell what's going on. My main problem with the horror of Chapter 2 is that most of the creatures within it are fully visible the entire time they're there. Now, don't get me wrong. You can't have a game where every monster is always always hidden until the last moment. It doesn't work that way. Sometimes monsters need to be in your face, but there are still better ways to utilize creatures that aren't on their surface scary. Ways that chapter three does beautifully, but we'll get there when we get there. Because the horror isn't the only problem I had with some of the earlier chapters of Poppy Playtime. There really wasn't a lot of cohesion with the horror and the main gameplay of puzzles. Chapter one and chapter two kind of felt like you went from puzzle to horror to puzzle to horror. And then the occasional chase sequence therein. You could argue that the chase sequence at the end of chapter one was an attempt at linking horror and puzzle gameplay, but the conveyor belt chase is less of a puzzle and more just confusing to throw off the player. And of course, chapter two had those separate game station mini games where they tried to combine horror and gameplay. But in my opinion, the core gameplay of Poppy Playtime and what makes it stands out are the grab pack power puzzles. They're really satisfying to do and some of them approach, not quite, but they approach Portal 2 levels for me, and Portal 2 is one of my favorite games. They give me those vibes. But that gameplay in Chapter 1 and 2 is never combined with horror. In fact, more often than not, they're in clean and separated sections of the facility. So my perfect Poppy Playtime would rectify those two issues. Better utilization of horror and better combination of puzzles and horror. So what did Poppy Playtime Chapter 3 do? Exactly that and more. Let's start off right away with monster design. Like we mentioned, Mob Entertainment has a challenge on the surface with Poppy Playtime. The monsters need to be scary to be an effective horror game, but they also need to believably be toys that children would want to buy. And Chapter 3 figured out a way to bridge this gap by utilizing hallucinations and age. The first major monster we directly encounter is the hallucination version of Huggy Wuggy. This thing's great. Incredibly thick and long arms, the outstretched fingers, the toothy grin and the massive eyes. As a monster, this is a great design, but of course, it's not at all a believable toy that a kid would purchase. But in that moment, it doesn't need to be. That entire section, also by the way, a great section, nails home the fact that we are very clearly experiencing hallucinations. So when the player sees this creature, they're not thrown off and taken aback, there's no whiplash. We're already experiencing horrific hallucinations, this is just another one. On the other hand, Miss Delight showcases how age can play into a creature design. And also, Miss Delight is a masterclass in showing character exposition through character design. In the school area, you can collect notes that give you the full backstory of Miss Delight that tells you that after the hour of joy, Catnap locked all of the Miss Delights in the school and waited until one was left. The one that was left was the one we meet, the same one who built a weapon named it Barb, lost her mind, went crazy and started talking to Barb as if it was a real person, and eventually resorted to eating the other Miss Delights to stay alive. The notes are brutal to read, and remind me of some of the darkest moments of Cooking Companions, another great game that deals with survival and starvation and cannibalism. The notes are amazing, but 
technically, I would argue they're not even necessary. Because even if you miss a bunch or all of these notes, one look at the environment and Miss Delight herself, and you can piece together what happened. The believable toy model is introduced to us throughout the school, on posters and cardboard cutouts. So we know what Miss Delight is supposed to look like, but then we meet what she turned into, and we see the exposed toothy mouth, the signs of struggle and fight all across the dress and body of her, and her only friend, a makeshift weapon of school supplies. One look at Miss Delight, and it is very clear that she has had to fight to survive in this school. This creature design works and is in context because the environment and the design itself explains exactly why she works this way. And one step further, the notes explain her gameplay. A lot of people were confused why she was a weeping angel, aka something that only moved when you weren't looking at it. But the notes explain this pretty much directly. When she had to eat the other Miss Delights to survive, Barb, her weapon, herself, her own mind, convinced her that if she laid incredibly still, the others would think she was dead, and that's when she could surprise them. So when she encounters us, she's doing the same tactic. She's waiting and laying completely still to avoid direct confrontation, and when her back is turned, she'll strike. Of course, we don't think she's dead in this moment, but she's crazy, so like, it works. So, Fucky Wucky over here and Miss Delight are perfect examples of hallucination and age playing into character design. But what happens when you have a toy that is so cute that neither a hallucination or age could make it scary? Well, you get the perfect example of that in the Smiling Critters. These guys are plush toys. They are small and adorable, and no matter how much you beat and bloody them up, they're still pretty cute. That is where utilization comes in. We've seen seen pictures and statues and cutouts and so much of the Smiling Critters, by the point we get to the Playhouse, we know exactly what the Smiling Critters are supposed to look like. But when we finally come face to face with these Smiling Critters, it's in a dark, cramped, enclosed space where the only light is a flare gun. Our flare gun. Not only that, but their numbers are relentless. We are surrounded, being chased, and trying to be eaten. The sheer volume and speed and unknowability of how many there are make them scary. And quick aside, but a flare gun that is not only our only source of light, but our only way to defend ourselves, and something that takes time to recharge is such a brilliant idea for a horror game. I'm surprised it took this long for me to see it in one. Regardless, you never get a great look at the smiling critters until they kill you. There's too many of them, they're too fast, and it's too dark. You have a good idea of what they look like, but the fear comes from that incessant chase. Not to mention, the only time that they are fully lit up in a time when it's not directly damaging to us is in probably the most horrifying cutscene of the game, but we'll talk about that closer to the end. Finally, the feline of the hour, don't get jealous, Mark, Catnap. Probably the best design in the franchise so far. At first glance, Catnap threads the line of believability and horror the same way that Huggy Wuggy does. Make it giant, that is inherently scary. And that works here, but it isn't nearly the full story for Catnap's design. Catnap, more than any other creature in this game, showcases the overarching theme of this franchise, starvation. Catnap is huge, sure, but he's skinny, lanky. You can see his vertebrae through his plush exterior. One look at Catnap and you are acutely aware of how starving he is, which immediately explains to you the danger that lies with this creature. But even better than that, its feline nature leans into how it's utilized in the game, stalking its prey. At some point in the game, Ollie explains to you that Catnap loves to stalk its prey for a long time before killing. It lives for the hunt. And that's very apparent, but I don't even think Ollie needed to tell us that. This entire game screams that Catnap is around every corner, and you're only alive because Catnap is letting you stay that way. Between the noises we hear in Home Sweet Home and the faces we see around the corner, to even the rooms that we don't see catnap. The school and the playhouse, ostensibly, we never see catnap inside of. But when you think about these locations and go through them, you realize that the school and the playhouse are only the way they are directly because of catnap. He is the one who locked the Miss Delights in there, creating the one we know. And he is the one who chains those who work against him in the playhouse, feeding the smiling critters they're in. I've seen some people compare catnap to Bendy, but in the way that Bendy is barely utilized in the original series, and they'll often say that Catnap should have had a larger role in the chapter because of all the hype around him. But I disagree with that. I think Catnap's presence seeps 
throughout every crack of this game. No matter where you go in it, Catnap is there and his presence is known. And that is effective utilization. All right, so we are well over 20 minutes into this video and we haven't even talked about the gameplay yet. So we should do that. The best way I can explain how well linked horror and gameplay are in this game is by using probably my favorite chapter of the game, the school. In my opinion, the school is a blueprint for how a good poppy playtime game can be created. When you first enter the school, you're introduced to the environment, the threat is teased at you, and you have time to do the puzzles. There's no threat, there's no time crunch, the player can look around and familiarize themselves with how the puzzles in this section are going to function. Then, about halfway through when the player finally has their bearings, a threat is introduced. Now they have to continue the puzzles they already know how to do underneath that threat and time crunch. In this case, Miss Delight. Suddenly, instead of just doing puzzles in various maze-like rooms, you have to do these puzzles while navigating and maneuvering around a weeping angel, a creature incredibly suited for this kind of of gameplay. The rest of this game mostly follows this blueprint. Home Sweet Home doesn't have any threat in it for the entire runtime, but that's because Home Sweet Home is sort of the setup for the rest of the game. You're using a lot of the mechanics and types of puzzles you're going to for the rest of the chapter, and because of that, Home Sweet Home, while terrifying, doesn't put an active threat in your way. It's already hard enough for a player to get their bearings. Just let them do that on their own time so you can threaten them later on. And then, halfway through the game when the flare gun is introduced, you give the player a huge cave to play around with this flare gun where it's not necessary, but it's clearly tempting to do so and get used to the weapon. And when you get to the playhouse, in a large open room, clearly lit, a smiling critter comes towards you. And a lot of players' first reaction is, ah, pop and suddenly they know how the mechanic works no tutorial necessary. That's good game design. Because then after that, you send the onslaught of smiling critters in the cramped space, a section of gameplay that would have been incredibly frustrating had the player not already known how the flare gun works. I'd even argue that part of the reason we go into such a large cave is so that players naturally want to try to light up a huge section of it and find out that they have a limited use of their flare gun and have to wait for it to recharge. I don't know if that was on purpose, probably was, but even if it wasn't, good on you. For this entire chapter, the player is able to figure out what they need to do, and then they do it under threat. Well, for most of this chapter. But before we talk about that, I said that Poppy Playtime Chapter 3 checks two of my biggest boxes and more. What's that and more? Mob Entertainment really pushed the envelope with how explicit you can be in a mascot horror game. Home Sweet Home is dripping with evidence of dead kids. It is a morbid environment to explore, but even more than that, you see this best in the Dog Day cutscene. Right before the last chase sequence of the playhouse, we meet Dog Day, or what's left of him, a chained up prisoner to catnap, missing his entire lower half. It doubles down on the threat that's already been established in this chapter, and then triples down, because right at the end of the cutscene, the smiling critters come to collect their meal, crawling inside of his open wound and eating out his insides. One of them even crawls through his eye. This, in my opinion, is the kind of horror that is most effective within mascot horror. If this was like a person that we saw chained up, cut in half, and creatures climbed inside of, it would lose effectiveness for, in my opinion, two reasons. One, the believability of this scene would go way down because a person would not survive cut in half and chained up. And when the body falls and begins being puppeted by the creatures that crawled inside of it, if that was a human, it just deteriorates. It doesn't work. It only works because Dog Day is a toy at the end of it. Like, he was a human made into a toy, but ostensibly now he is a toy. So ironically, being a toy makes the scene more believable. But there's another reason I think this is more effective in mascot horror, and that's just the gore. I'm not prudish when it comes to gore. Gore in horror games can be used very effectively. But a scene like this, I think, would just be gratuitous. It would lean more onto like the later Saw movies after James Wan left, when it turned into just gore for gore's sake and not actually like specific horrific scenes. Because the gore is turned down just a little bit by the fact that he's not a real human, this scene is incredibly effective and one of my favorite scenes in a horror game ever. But unfortunately, as good as this game has been so far, it kind of falls apart at the end. I talked a lot about how earlier moments in this game 
explain a mechanic to the player and then throw the mechanic at them under threat as a good gameplay like loop. And Poppy Playtime Chapter 3 does this brilliantly for like 80% of the runtime. The first 80% of the runtime. But then the counselor's office and the catnap boss fight kind of swing and miss. The counselor's office, in my opinion, just really slows the game down. There's no active threat or sense of urgency for the entire chunk of the chapter. You're just doing puzzles in a somewhat creepy environment. Frankly, the least creepy environment so far. There's one really good scene of Bunzo getting killed by Catnap, but I would argue Home Sweet Home does this whole concept a lot better. And sure, this is coming off of the school and the playhouse back to back, so maybe they wanted to give the player a breather here. Well, if you wanted to do that, that should have just been the first half of the counselor's office. Maybe because this is like where Catnap is getting more aggressive, the first half could just be the counselor's office, and the second half we have to do the same thing, but avoiding Catnap, maybe hiding past him or distracting him with a flare gun or something. Because the entire section is threat free, it really slows down the pace of the game. It felt like we were building all this momentum and then we crash like 20 minutes before the end of the game. And that momentum never really picks back up because immediately after this, something that confuses the hell out of me happens. Ollie explains that the main reason we're moving around in the play care is that we need to activate backup generators within the buildings and then reroute their power to the main power at the base of the building so we can power the gas area. And we do this with Home Sweet Home. We turn on the backup generator, we leave, we plug in a cord and it goes to 50%. And Ollie explains we need to do one more building. So we go to the school, but Miss Delight damages that generator. So, okay, got it. That's game happening game. Then we go to the playhouse and we don't really see a main backup generator so we can't do it there either that's why when we get out of the playhouse ollie's like okay there's really only one building left we need to go to the counselor's office and catnap might be in there but be careful and then we do the counselor's office we turn on the generator we leave and we plug in the cable but then it goes to 96 percent and you get a key for something called the sky dome something that has never been introduced to us as far as i'm aware we are never told what the sky dome is and it's not on the map at the front of the area so now, in a pitch black giant- oh, I mean fair, this video is long as hell. So now, in a giant pitch black environment, the player has to just figure it out with no direction. Now, this key does have the emblem of a lockbox we saw the entire game ago. Right after Home Sweet Home, there's a cutscene where Poppy and Kissy Missy take us up on a lift and show us the place and turn on the power and then leave us be. And in that cutscene, we're going to the Sky Dome. That's, I assume, what this area is. And on the lockbox she opens is the same flower that our key has. So if you can remember what you did like four hours ago, you can piece this together. And that lockbox is lit up. But there had to have been a way better way to telegraph this. Or even better, this is mob entertainment if you're watching this. First off, thank you so much. Love the game you made. I promise you, this will make your game like 10 times better. Don't do that. Just cut this whole thing out. When you plug in the counselor's office, just have the battery appear. I don't know why we have to plug in the Sky Dome for the extra 4% of power. Or hell, if you're in insistent on having us plug in the Sky Dome, have us do it right after the Poppy and Kissy Missy cutscene when we're next to it. Because this section in every stream I've watched for this game has every player going, what the hell am I supposed to do now? I thought I plugged this in and go to gas and now I can't. Not to mention the people like me who plugged it in and went, cool, let's go to gas. And they meet a locked door after a loading zone and are just confused as all hell. Like luckily every streamer I've watched has a chat that they can be like, hey, what am I supposed to do here and then somebody in chat in a few of the streams me was like hey for whatever reason go to that sky place that kissy missy and uh poppy were at and plug in that cord too and then you can do that it, it's just it's so confusing to me i don't know why it's here it just really wipes the momentum that's been being built on top of what happened at the counselor's office because for a lot of players i've seen you just wander around in the dark for like 30 minutes which really kills the mood and there's one other issue here the very next thing you do the catnap boss fight the boss fight for catnap is really cool and really fun in concept conceptually the idea of using every hand we've collected in this chapter and every mechanic we've done to defend ourselves and attack against catnap is awesome. And in concept, the idea of taking our defenses and slowly stripping them away one by one to use against catnap is awesome. Conceptually, I love this boss fight, but it is 
not telegraphed to the player in an understandable way. Because even though we're using the gloves and mechanics we've learned up until now, we're doing something we've never done before in this game, using steam to prevent catnap from attacking us. And sure, there's a little like monitor that flashes instructions at us, but it's not very effective. A lot of people I've seen play the game, myself included, walk up and see the monitor say, prepare yourself, catnap is coming, and go, cool, and then not look at the monitor again. But even if you read the full monitor, it doesn't quite explain it in a very understandable way. And explaining it isn't even the issue. Like I've mentioned earlier in this chapter, the best way for your player to know what to do is have them do it without threat in a very easy to understand way, and then have them do it under threat in a slightly harder way. That feels cohesive. Like, I don't know how else it could be done. It's probably too late to patch anything in. Like, maybe in another universe, if Catnap was an active threat in the second half of Counselor's Office, maybe at some point in there we could use Steam to protect ourselves from him. So at least when you get there and something turns on Steam, you know what's going on. Just learning how to beat Catnap is not intuitive at all. On replays, now that I know how to defeat Catnap, it's a really fun and compelling boss fight. But figuring that out takes, like, like five to six tries just to know what's going on. And that is compounded by one other issue I have, and that's the RNG with Catnap. Don't get me wrong, for a boss fight like Catnap, RNG is a necessity. You need the attacks to be random for this to be fun at all. But in gameplay, it seems like the RNG is completely unbounded. Now, like I said, I'm not a game designer, I'm not a programmer, I don't know how these things actually work. But I've seen fights go where Catnap attacks like three times a minute for the entire fight, and I've seen Catnap boss fights where Catnap just doesn't attack the player for almost the entire boss fight. And neither of those are a very fun time. It needs to be closer to the middle. But when you consider that a lot of people take five to six attempts to know what's going on, I've seen a few streams where someone is doing the catnap boss fight and their first three attempts, they get swamped and swept by catnap. And on their like fourth attempt, he just doesn't attack except for like twice. And then they won because it was easy that time. And that does not feel good as a player, trust me. The RNG there may be easy to patch. Like I said, I don't know programming or anything, but if you guys at Mob are still watching, before I move on to the conclusion, my two biggest requests that, at least in my not a programmer, not a game designer brain, seem like easy things to implement that will make the game a lot more fun for a lot more players, take out the fucking Sky Dome plug and tighten the bounds for the RNG of Catnap. And also, if anyone from the team of Project Playtime is watching this, please add private parties back or create a matchmaking system system that you can party up for because it is like unplayable right i love project playtime it is so fun but it's really hard to get into a match with my friends please make it easy but those two requests will make this game so much more enjoyable and a perfect example of why is my conclusion some of you watching this video right now might think that i don't like poppy playtime chapter three even though ostensibly the majority of this video is me telling you how much i like the chapter but i ended the video with what i didn't like and more often than not the ending of something is what sticks with you. That's why people always say when giving criticism, it's best to give a compliment sandwich, something you like, the negative criticisms, and something else that you liked. That way, you're still giving an overall positive message with important criticisms in the middle. And whenever I talked about game design previously on this channel, I did just that because I wanted to make sure it was clear that I liked what I was talking about. But I specifically didn't do it for this because I think it's emblematic of why the issue at the end of Poppy Playtime chapter three is such a big issue. The bad taste that it left in the mouth of a lot of players. Chapter three is one of the best mascot horror games I've ever played. And one of the best horror games I've played in a very long time. And that first 80% of the runtime is perfect. But the 20% at the end is so confusing and poorly shown to the player that some of the reception I've seen online is people saying that like, ah, I didn't know what to do for the entire time. And I'm almost certain that they did. They just didn't know what to do at the end. And that took them like an extra hour because of it. I want to make it very clear. I absolutely loved Poppy Playtime Chapter 3. It's just that the majority of my criticisms of the chapter all happen within the last like 45 minutes of the game. But I am genuinely excited to see what we have left in store for the rest of Poppy Playtime and whatever Mob Entertainment does next. So what did you guys think about Chapter 3? And thanks for hanging out for a non-FNAF video. Don't get me wrong, I love Five Nights at Freddy's and the majority of content on this channel will always be Five Nights at Freddy's unless something drastically happens. But it's great for my sanity to talk about 
about other things I'm passionate about. And if you couldn't tell, I'm very passionate about game design and horror. This video is like 40 minutes long, probably. But if you're desperate for some Five Nights at Freddy's content as a palate cleanser, somebody found a huge discovery that everyone missed in Help Wanted. I'm not kidding. It like reinforces a theory so strongly, stronger than I've seen in most theories. So I covered that last week. The video is right here. If you want your fan art showcased on the channel, make sure to use hashtag right tart. A huge shout out to the best channel members, the Dough Risers. And until next time, as always, stay toasty slices.